did not, at um, the beginning of the service, announce we will now. At, at this church, we do allow, thank you, we do allow for uh, questions uh, to be put to the speaker, pastor, uh, about what was said during the sermon. So um, we ask for your questions now if you have them. We have them right here. I'm hoping this is the thing. I'm sorry. Because we have to get on the tape. Just what about the case where Hold it up to your mouth. a wife is there, professing yeah. to know Christ, but then they leave their husband because of the husband having trouble with alcohol? How would you view that in light of what you just taught? Okay. Um, what do you mean? Uh, sorry. What do you mean by trouble with alcohol? Um, well, actually, she... She left him, and so now that it's definitely taken, overpowered him. Before it was probably on a weekly basis, so now it's becoming definitely alcoholism. Was she hurting him, or was he hurting her? Verbally. Okay. Was Verbally. okay. Okay. Was she being cared for? Yes. Okay. I I, will, I would argue that Paul's message here is you stay in the, that marriage as long as you possibly can. I don't think Paul ever, or the scriptures ever, ask us to uh, be, um, certainly be physically abused, ever. I mean, you know, you, you wouldn't tell someone you have to stay there even though it's going to kill you. That's, that's, not, that's not what Paul's talking about here. But the emphasis that he's saying here, and without laying down actual rules, he's, he's laying down an emphasis for us. Try as hard as you, can, as you possibly can. But that's why he says, but God has called us to peace. Right, that, that's what caused me to question right. you, because she would say there was no peace. Right. And if if she can, if, if there is no peace, then I would argue that Paul's saying this morning she can leave. She can leave that situation. Not, and, and, but her attempt is, her, her, her goal is to be reconciled to her husband. Not to go, oh, hey, that was, I got this problem, not to go marry somebody else. That's not what Paul's saying. I, and then without, I, I would argue that the emphasis and that entire passage would be quite different without that little phrase, but God has called us to peace. I think Paul there introduces the standard by which we can judge some of these things, which are so difficult to judge. Good question. Who else has a question about this challenging passage? So I think you said in the beginning that pagan cultures enslave, or women, women are enslaved in, in pagan cultures. But our, our culture is, is uh, trying to, uh, and, and what they think is enhance women, uh, empowering women for leadership, and there's this whole diversity and inclusion issue in the workplace where you know, they're trying to get women in leadership positions and, uh, in their mind, empower women. So how is that really contrasting to really enslavement? Sure. Um, and I would answer that by saying, give us time. Um, yeah, it's, it's working out right now, the whole the whole women in, in, in empowerment thing. But who is actually doing that? It's men who are stepping aside. You see, when you when you get to the point where you have a culture that's based on power alone, you're going to have what you have in Rome. The father says, I want this child to live or die. Toss the child out. You know, and the children got tossed in the water. They got abandoned outside the city walls. Uh, when predators of all different types came. And that will happen as the society breaks down because we have a society that's less and less based on principle and more and more based on, on power. Give it time. See, right now, we, we it was Francis Schaeffer who called it a cut flower culture, if you will. We're abandoning God and his word. And this is, a, this is a type of culture I believe Jeremiah ministered in. People were abandoning God and his word, but still one of the benefits. And that's what we do. You know, we're promoting all these ridiculous, frankly, ideas of cultural ideas that are not in the scriptures. But we still believe in being polite, uh, driving on our side of the road. That's left over from our Christian culture. It's not going to be there that much longer. It might, it might last a generation or two, maybe. But I think we can see it like going. I think we can see it disappearing right in front of our eyes. Um, I'll give you an example of it. Controversial, difficult. But is anyone else concerned about police violence? 
Has, has anybody been following that a little bit? <coughs> I remember I remember years ago noticing that every time the police would show up in a raid, if you had a pet, that pet was going to be killed. I noticed that myself years ago. They would shoot the cat, they would shoot the dog, or one, any time I would notice that. Well, it's going beyond the pets now. I'll tell you, when I was little, you respected the police officer. You did. He was out there to protect you. Now we, we see it's, it's breaking down. And we see, we see it breaking down most of the areas of power and responsibility. The police officers have power. They have responsibility. They, get, they got the gun. Where it breaks down, we see it start to break down right there. I, I have told my, my wife and my daughters, I, I'll, just, I'll just lay it out for you. One take. I have told my wife and my daughters, if you ever get pulled, if it's at night, or even during the day, and you ever get pulled aside by a police officer, you get on the phone with me right then, right, right now. I, I want to know what's going on. Because I don't trust all of the, all of the officers. Yeah. I remember years ago reading a, um, a bumper sticker. Years ago. Here's what it said. It said, feel safe tonight, sleep with a cop. See the breakdown? The police officers don't believe in the institution of marriage. Do you think they're really going to be out to protect us? The breakdown is happening, even though, and then we see it transitionally. But again, in a culture based on power. The powerful people, it's the men, they're, they're stronger, let's face it. You're allowed to say that in America. Taking at random, men are generally bigger and stronger than women. Can we say that? It's actually true. They get powerful, and what happens to everybody else? Children get abandoned, and women become slaves. Um, as, as far as women like being empowered in our culture, and it really looks to people like we worship women like they're not slavery and we're not slaves, but it actually is a different kind of slavery. Because if you're a woman, you really can't do what you want. Like, you really can't be a powerful woman and say, you know what, I really would like to submit to my husband, and I would like to not work and stay at home with my kids. It really is slavery of a different kind. And with the amount of single moms that are just rising, like, they're not free. Like, they're not empowered. They're just alone and, and trapped. Well, I got nothing to add to that. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, I do. <laughs> Sorry, I knew was shocked. Shocked. One of the saddest calls I used to get um, was um, from when I worked with a company that was um, working with homeschoolers. And this company would try to help people would, this company would provide curriculum and guidance for people who were homeschooling, and oftentimes it was for people that were new at it but didn't feel adequate to do it. And one of the saddest calls I would get, and I got quite a few of these, was the uh, single mom who would call up and say, my child is being bullied at school. How can you help me? I want to, I want, I want to bring him home. And I would say, well, here's what it costs. And go, I don't have that kind of money. And I would say, and I never got a yes to this question, I would say, is there anyone else in your sphere of influence, in your family, do you have an uncle, do you have a grandparent, a parent, anybody who is concerned about the education of your child and would help you pay for this because this company didn't have scholarships? And you know what I got every time? Every time, every time, and I know what I'm talking about here because I was listening for the first time to change and it never did. Every time I got no, there was nobody. See, what it ha apparently it happened was, for whatever reason, the relationships had broken down so horribly in this family that she had no one that she could reach out to. Now, how did that happen? It happened on the way to be independent and doing her own thing. We're going to talk about bondage. That was it. That, that was it. It was horrible to hear. Who else has a question? Yep. Question. <laughs> um, I've 
guess I want to comment on this. I've yeah. been reading a lot about this, as you know, just marriage and sure. women who have been um, oppressed in some way, and sure. especially verbally. Sure. And one of the things I'm seeing more and more now is um, the, I want to call it an accusation, perhaps it's just an observation, that the church has idolized marriage to such a degree that they're missing the abuse to women or men, whoever, or children, that we so we have so prioritized the marriage that we're missing the individuals within that marriage. Just your comment based on this. Yeah, I think that's why, I, I think, I would understand the Puritan position as, as taking that into account, which was an abandonment. See, at, at, at some point. An uh, in-house abandonment. Absolutely, even though they're still living in the same house. A husband be say be raiding a wife, destroying her every way. That's that definitely qualifies as abandonment. Um, God, God has called me. I, 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 we can idolize God's institutions. Have we idolized marriage? I I would argue we have in the case where a church, and this has happened, where a church just wants to say fix a marriage as some sort of a trophy. I mean, look, we went out, we fixed this. And with, without considering the, the, the damage that they're doing, they don't care about the damage. At that point, they made an idol out of marriage. But I would say all, as I've said before, all idols are ultimately not the wooden stone. It's ultimately me. Hey, look me, I'm a pastor. I fixed everybody's marriages. He didn't fix anything. The idol is it's right here, as it always is. Yes, John. Verse 12 says, but to the rest I say, not the Lord, that, and then he goes on to speak. You want to address the, you know, this is that, this is Holy Scripture. Right. So, <laughs> you know, the Lord saying it. Right. And read, read that again if you would. Yes. But to the rest I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife, there's an unbeliever. And right. Goes. A definite challenging statement. Did you, did you all hear that? This is Holy Scripture, and Paul's saying, well, I'm saying this, God's not saying it. <clears throat> Man, what do, we, what do we do with this? Um, a, a, a difficult passage. Um, two things about that. First one is, if, have you ever noticed that Job's friends said an awful lot of things? At the end, you know, when, when Job and his friends were talking, and, um, of course, they got an argument with Job, and Job comes back and says, I'm not who you say I am. They were saying you sinned greatly because God is punishing you greatly. What else can we conclude? Job was saying I didn't sin greatly. I haven't done what you said I've done. They went back and forth and they argued. At the end of it all, Job has to, um, has to um, offer a sacrifice for his friends because God said they didn't speak accurately about it. Remember that? Job actually had to sacrifice for his friends. So what do we do with all the things that his friends said? And we see, what well, here's what we see. We see some of the things his friends said quoted as scripture in the New Testament. How do you do that? Second thing is this. Some people believe the best they can do with this is that there were some commands given by Christ that people knew about that didn't get in scripture either. Some people knew about some of those commands. And so Paul is making a distinction. He says, I... I'm saying this, the Lord himself has not said this, but I'm saying it. And I am, and later on he says, and I think I have the Spirit of God. So some people think that's, that, that's what that is. In either case, we have, if you want to say that this is sort of a sub-authority, uh, which you can't do, but if, if, if you could, the worst case scenario, you still don't have any great authority anyway. You, you, you still got the apostle that is something that we'll have to look at when we get the bibliology, probably eight or ten years from now. <laughs> yeah, I, I do want to get I do want to get the bibliology here and, and preach a series of sermons on that. How we got our Bible, how we're supposed to interpret it, how how it can be trusted, how it must be trusted. A lot to be said there. Because uh, if you don't trust the Bible, if you don't trust the Word of God. You have to trust the Word of man. And uh, we might as well all be home watching. I don't even know what's on right now. Whatever. Joe looks at me, watching. Who else has a question?